pathogens are being exposed to, and then they can just develop immunity. I mean, I guess. That's the best case scenario. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, <laughs> I got strep throat like every other month for like a year and a half solid, and then like, I don't think I've ever had strep throat ever again. That's what I'm saying. So just throw them in the ball pit and expose them to all the germs and they'll be great. So I had to suffer for a year, but you know. <laughs> hey everybody, it's uh, Camera Academy, also known as Immunity Academy. We yes. teach you how to immunize your kids the natural way by throwing them in the gross ball pit. At, I don't uh, have Chuck kids e. though. Well, well, we're working on it. No, I, I, I don't think I'm gonna ever want kids. What? I don't know. I'm but think of all the wonderful genes you have to pass on. Eh, I don't really have that many good genes. <sighs> well, uh, regardless, uh, we're here at Camera Academy to uh, pass on our knowledge, if yes, not our genetics, we to uh, our fans and uh, friends and family. So, hey everybody, welcome to Camera Academy. This is uh, Nick, along with Nikolai over here. hey -o. And, uh, of course, we are coming to you live not live, recorded, no, we're, but... We're kind of recording. We're coming to you from... Uncensored. <laughs> we're coming to you from Cometa uh, Camera. I almost forgot the name of our company. Our lovely sponsor for this <laughs> podcast. Yeah, not a sponsor, but uh, the company we work for, and we are glad to uh, sit here and collect a paycheck and tell you about photography. Which technically makes them a sponsor. I guess, technically? Technically. I don't really know the technicalities. Neither do I'm I, I'm not but... paid to know that. Yeah. I'm only paid to know about things like sensor sizes, which is yes. what we're going to be talking about today on Camera Academy. So uh, before we get into the topic at hand, I think we should just address um, where you can find Cometa Camera. First of all, you can go to cometa.com if you want to purchase cameras and lenses and photography accessories. And if you want to get in touch with us on social media, you can do that as well by going to facebook.com slash cometa camera or just find us on Twitter at cometa. And I think we're on Instagram, too. At Cometa Camera. At Cometa Camera. And uh, I don't know, are we on Snapchat or any of those things that the kids are using these days? We do not have Snapchat. But we're working on it. We have to work on getting our Instagram <laughs> We just hired a kid first. who's younger than us, significantly younger than us, so maybe she'll mm. teach us how to use it. Yeah, our old timers here. <laughs> I mean, I know how to use Snapchat. I just really don't know how to implement it for this job. Hmm. I say. like, I, I, I'm one of those guys who's like, I know all these things, but I don't want to learn any more about it, you know? Yeah. I can figure out this technology, but I don't want to. I mean, technically. I don't want to learn about new music or new shows or anything like that. Movies with these kids these days. Technically, Instagram and Facebook already, like, incorporated Snapchat into their programs. Well, Facebook's just buying everything, right? Yeah. So they're just I mean, they have their own versions of it, but Snapchat's definitely still, like, the best for, like, those 24-hour disappearing fun snaps you can make i see yeah, I can't even really sending think of nudes name, basically is what it's all, all it's good for no i mean like I, I believe that's how it started out right but then it just became like a cultural like phenomenon thing a phenomenon number. i mean think about it like whenever you like want to make like a stupid post on facebook or something like that and you don't as like, we often do and you know you just realize like you kind of think to yourself it's like and eh, i really don't want to post that and have that like sit there forever mm. that's the thing about snapchat you can make a post and it just disappears in 24 hours if your friends aren't like, um, don't have a vendetta against you and don't screenshot it. Um, but the other good thing about Snapchat is if you do screenshot it, it actually sends an alert <gasps> to the sender saying, "No kidding, this person, this person took a screenshot of what you I'm did." They're gonna snitch on you. Mm -hmm. Shh. You kids in your filthy pictures. <laughs> I'm sure there's some kind of program out there that negates it, but <clears throat> probably. Hey. Uh, let's talk about sensor types. Yes. <laughs> so uh, that is the topic at hand today. Um, as you know, when you're uh, learning or about photography and uh, you're going out there looking for a new camera or whatever, there's lots to consider. And um, your sensor size and your sensor type is really one of those things that's more important than you might realize. So we're going to break it down for you today and uh, hopefully give you a good little education about uh, the different types of sensors that are out there and the different sizes and how it affects your photography overall. Yep. Isn't that right, Nicola? Yes, it All is. Right, well, let's get started. So uh, let's start off with a little bit of history. So in the older days, when people were using film and they were developing it in a dark room, <laughs> Uh, oh, light finger. entered through the lens, and when you would actuate the shutter, the light would go through and it would hit a piece of film. And uh, basically the film was exposed to the light, there are photosensitive chemicals in the film that would react to the light, and therefore you would have uh, 
once you developed it, you would have your image, depending on how much light hit each one of those sensors. So I guess we're not all... sensors. <laughs> I'm skipping ahead. Uh, photosensitive chemicals. So I'm assuming that there were different film sizes. Uh, of course, there are different film sizes, but um, why don't we talk about those? Or oh, you want to talk about that? Let's give well, a little more saying, extra it's, history. It's kind of like a direct comparison because, like, you have yeah. 35 millimeter size. You it have is. ones that are smaller and larger, and depending on the size of the film. Well, most people are familiar with the 35 millimeter, yeah. right? But if you were, let's say, 15 years ago or so, if you were getting um, wedding portraits done, someone would come along with a huge medium format camera, and they would actually have to pull out large sheets of film that mm -hmm. were considerably larger than your 35 millimeter spooled film and so you had your medium formats and then you had your cheap little toy cameras like your 110 formats and you also had large formats and you do have large formats if you were getting a little Which bit crazy are those old school like big bellow ones that you had to have the little black curtain to put over your head right and you held a bird over your head with, yes and then you had that little uh, bulb that yep. you would squeeze to uh, actually trigger the, the uh, I've flash used those the cameras. Trigger. They are so fun to use, but they are such a pain. <laughs> I've never tried one. Um, they seem way too complicated. And I know that's stupid because people were perfectly capable of using them yeah. uh, 50, 60 years ago. It's a lot of work calling. to use them, though. It's a lot of setup. You know, and you only get so many exposures because the film's so large. Right. But, all right, so there were different... But back to the digital age. <laughs> there were different formats of film and... Uh, now we have different sizes of uh, digital sensors. Now, a digital image sensor is basically like your frame of film, but instead of light-sensitive chemicals, it uses millions of little light-sensitive spots, and those are called photodiodes, or AKA pixels, um, photo spots. They, they, there's different names for it, but let's just use pixels yes. for uh, brevity's sake. Ooh, fancy word. Brevity. Brevity. And it's the soul of wit, just so you know. Ah. ah. <laughs> so um, when the light hits these pixels, mm -hmm. I was about to say photodiodes, but when it is, let's just use pixels. When the light hits these spots, it's essentially converted then into uh, electrical signals, and that becomes your image data. That's stored to your memory card, and that's your image data. So your light is converted to electricity, which becomes digital image data. Data. Everybody following? Data. Yes. Now... The term megapixels, which we use uh, quite often to describe the resolution of your mm -hmm. image sensor, comes from this because you have millions of pixels on your image sensor, and every million is equal to mega, right? So mega. if you have 24 million pixels on your image sensor, that's a 24 megapixel image sensor. Yes. And makes sense. It does make sense. It's pretty easy to figure out. Now, megapixels don't mean what they used to. No. Obviously, because back in the old days, um, we'll say that we start with the uh, the first um, widely available digital camera, which was the uh, Apple, Apple Quick Take, right? It had like 640 by 480 resolution, which equates to 0 0.3 megapixels. Is that the one that used floppy disks? No, that was the Sony um, Mavica. Ah. And I had one of those, and those were great too. But uh, yeah, they were about the same uh, resolution there like the true floppy disk when i did it when it stored like four pictures or something like yeah, that yeah it was pretty rough <laughs> <laughs> but um you start you know if you think back to that was only in the mid 90s right and then yeah it's crazy um by the time the 2000s came along uh canon introduced their first professional dslr which was the um 1d the eos 1d mm -hmm. that had just over four megapixels it's and, so fun to think about. And then now, just uh, you know, 17 years later or 16 years later, now we've got cameras that are capable 50 of... 50 megapixel monsters. And yeah, some crazy megapixel counts. Now, the thing is, over the last mm, five, six, seven years or so, megapixel, the megapixel war has subsided. So every year, there, companies aren't coming out with extra megapixels just to one-up their competition. Megapixels aren't as important as they used to be because we've reached sort of a saturation point where they're yeah. really not that important. Like, well, I guess well, I'll get into that later. But before I lose my train of thought, full-frame cameras now are pretty much equivalent to 35 millimeter format film. Yeah, <clears throat> and they all basically have the same general uh, megapixel yeah. count. Yeah, if I if I remember right, I think yeah, like 
mid 20s to 30s is megapixels is equal to like the resolution of a 35 millimeter piece of film. And we've we've reached that point where we don't really need to continue upping the megapixel count because no, because then it's you start diminishing getting, returns. Yeah, you start getting cons. Like you start developing more noise in your pictures the higher the pic or the higher the megapixels go. Right. And that's like I mean that to me that's like the biggest downfall because you don't want a lot of artifacts and grain and stuff in your pictures if you can avoid it at higher ISOs. Yeah. So we're going to get into those pros and cons, but we just wanted to give you a little bit of history about um, just a little. image sensors and whatnot. So speaking of which, there's two different types of image sensors. One that is not used very often anymore, but still exists. And then the one that we use quite, uh, quite a lot these days is very common. First off, there's the CCD. Mm. Stands for Charge Coupled Device for those of you who find that sort of thing important. Um, those are cheap. They're still in use in low-end cameras, like really low-end point-and-shoots. Um, and for years, they had superior image quality compared to CMOS image sensors. However, um, that kind that has basically uh, been that advantage of CCDs has basically been eliminated yes. at this point. So now we're all using CMOS, CMOS sensors. And except for the really, like I said, the really budget point and shoots, CMOS is what you're going to find on everything. That acronym stands for, and I know you're really interested in this, Complementary Metal Oxide Semiconductor. Oof. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds sexy. I mean, the main advantage there... <laughs> The main difference is that um, the, the circuitry is the, it's integrated. Circuitry is integrated into each pixel as opposed to like off to the side of the uh, sensor. So CMOS sensors are faster. You get better burst rates. Um, they consume less power. So if you remember, like ten years ago, when everything had a CCD, they would suck batteries dry in like minutes. Oh, yeah. You barely get any chance to, to shoot before you'd have to change out your AA batteries. But now it's not the case. Now cameras can last a lot longer and you can shoot hundreds of shots with a single battery charge. And that's thanks in large part to CMOS image sensors. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the development of lithium-ion batteries, <clears> too. <throat> that, too. They've but come a long way in the past couple of years. Yes, they have. Um, so those are your two types of image sensors. CMOS is basically your standard. It's pretty much on everything. Um, Panasonic and Olympus use an image sensor called a live MOS, which is basically a CMOS, but they claim that it has better image quality, um, sort of akin to uh, CCD sensors. Okay. I don't know if that's really true, but that's what they claim. So they, they have like their own brand name for it. And then Sigma has the uh, Foveon X3 sensors, which are basically like a CMOS sensor, except they have different color like, filters I think, over yeah, it. Yeah, there's like different layers that they put on top of yeah. each other. But um, we do sell uh, Sigma cameras. Uh, unfortunately, they're not quite as popular. They, they are popular with people who really want super high detail, and they tend to gravitate towards those type of yeah. sensors, but they're not common by any means. No. It's sort of a proprietary uh, image sensor made by Sigma. So those are your two basic types of image sensors. Now, of course, there's many different sizes, which we'll go over right now. First of all, you've got your full frames. Yes. And as you said, uh, equivalent in size to a 35 millimeter frame of film. Yeah, a full frame sensor gets you a lot of detail, really good ISO control. And those are the main two benefits of that one. Right, because... Essentially, with a larger sensor, you have larger photodiodes. Yes. So you have larger pixels. And if the pixels are larger, they can collect more light. And if you can collect more light, you can have better low-light performance. You'll have better um, dynamic range. Mm -hmm. You will have... Uh, help me out here. <laughs> there, there, are other, there are other benefits besides that. Those I'm are just like talking the main about, benefits, I'm talking though. about like light collection. Um, yes, those would be the two main ones. The other benefits of full-frame sensors have to do with other aspects of it. And that's also why full-frame sensors tend to have a little bit more megapixels, too. They do, but if they have an equivalent amount of megapixels to a smaller sensor, it's because they make the pixels larger. Yes. And you have more light collection ability. So the main thing there is um, better low-light performance, which is important to photographers of any level. Mm-hmm. Um, Full-frame cameras 
are generally a bit larger uh, a because you have expensive. to have you have to have more space to accommodate that sensor, mm -hmm. and because you have a larger sensor, uh, sensor you have to have a lo uh, larger distance to the lens. Mm -hmm. So you generally will have a larger camera body, and also coupled with larger lenses. Yep, you will have larger lenses, um, and because those things are larger, they're generally more expensive. And heavier. And heavier. So you'll have heavier, larger, more expensive camera bodies and lenses as well. Mm -hmm. um, so those are a couple of negatives. But generally speaking, professionals tend to go with full frame because the positives outweigh those negatives. Yes. Now, one of the other benefits is you get better bokeh or background blur when you're shooting with full frame bodies and lenses. Now explain how that works. Um, you're basically getting more coverage around the area of the image. So when you're seeing more of like, how do I explain this? It's covering more of the glass. You get a wider image coverage of the area. So when you're using a zoomed in lens, like a, you know, telephoto wise with a, a large aperture opening, it's going to give you more depth of field. Okay. So if you have two lenses on, one's on a full frame camera and one's on a camera with a smaller sensor, and you have the same angle of view, you're going to get better background blur on the full frame, generally because of the way the frame, the, uh, the camera body and the lens sort of interact with Correct. each other. All right. So full frame sensors, better in low light, better dynamic range, you're going to get better color, they're better for shooting in RAW. Yes. Um, full frame sensors are basically what any professional photographer is going to gravitate towards because of all those benefits. And um, But if you're not a professional photographer, or sometimes even if you are, mm -hmm. uh, there are plenty of crop sensor uh, vert, um, formats to choose from. The most common being APS-C, which mm -hmm. is what you will find in sort of the uh, consumer and prosumer levels uh, from Canon and Nikon, uh, Sony, all of their A6000 series, the A5000 series, those mm -hmm. are all APS-C sensors. The Nikon D5000 series, the Canon T6, I mean the, T, the Canon T series, I'm sorry. Yep. And don't forget all of Fujifilm's X-series cameras. Yep, all CMOS. All, uh, all APS-C CMOS sensors. Now, an APS-C is roughly... Mm, 60 to 65 percent of the size of a full frame sensor so you will be sacrificing on uh ability to collect light mm -hmm. because generally they're going to have eh, the same resolution or thereabouts as a full frame sensor but the pixels will be smaller so you won't able you won't be able to collect as much light and you'll have some disadvantages there it won't generally be as powerful as a full frame camera now there's things that can make up for it. There's differences, obviously, in terms of features from, you know, full frames to crop sensor cameras. But generally speaking, the crop sensor cameras are going to be cheaper, smaller. They definitely range in price and size, but they're going to be cheaper, smaller, and they're going to have, they're not going to be as versatile and powerful as a full frame camera. However, you can get great pictures with either format. They're also usually a little faster when firing. That's true because they have less data to export. Mm -hmm. That's why a lot of professional sports photographers or wildlife photographers will use a uh, a crop sensor camera because they, they shoot a little faster. Not only that, is that their zoom lenses will get a little more distance, a little more telephoto reach than if they were put on a full frame. Yes, and uh, you can learn more about that if you check out our previous episode on focal length. We get into uh, crop factor mm -hmm. later on in the episode. So um, apart from the APS-C, there is other types of crop sensors. For example, there is the four-thirds sensor, or micro four-thirds as it's called these days. Mm -hmm. That is about 45 to 50% of a full-frame sensor, so considerably smaller. Uh, like you said, the advantage is there, or you are more likely to get more speed. Mm -hmm. So Olympus cameras are actually very popular with uh, sports shooters. I've seen, uh, especially in the tennis community, <laughs> uh, people really seem to enjoy Olympus. It's one of uh, the like U.S. tennis's biggest sponsors because they can provide that kind of uh, frame rate, 
with those smaller sensors. Yep. So that's an advantage of a smaller sensor like a micro four thirds. Um, and then you have your one inch sensors, which are even smaller than that. That's about 35% of the size of a full frame sensor. And those are the ones you'll see on premium compact cameras like Sony's RX100 series, uh, Canon's power shots like the uh, G7 Mark II. Yeah. Um, you will also see it on high zoom cameras, stuff like Panasonic makes, like the FZ series, FC300, FC1000. Uh, Those cameras will have a one inch sensor. Ooh, we got pizza going on in the background. Yep, we I might have it. to pa uh, pause for the cause and go get some pizza while, <laughs> before we finish up this podcast. But, um, and then the other camera that uses one inch sensors are Nikon's one series. Uh, and that's their range of mirrorless interchangeable lens cameras. Yeah. And they use a relatively small sensor compared to their competition, which is kind of why they're not doing so well. Now, honorable mentions, we should also mention that um, Fujifilm did come out with a affordable medium format uh, size sensor, yes, which is above full frame. But those get tend to be a little more expensive and out of our like consumer demographics, I guess. Yeah, if you're going with a medium format sensor, um, Fujifilm basically has the only affordable medium format sensor that's on the market right now. As we record this. Mm -hmm. There are medium format backs that you can attach to um, Hasselblad, Hasselblad cameras and things like that. And those are very expensive, but of course they do provide uh, premium resolution. But so I feel like anyone that would be using that kind of camera wouldn't, wouldn't be, be listening to, to this, this show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're probably right. Um, and should we do an honorable mention with the good old fashioned smartphone sensors, which I, because I know there's going to be questions about that. Yeah, so smartphone image sensors are far smaller than anything you're going to find on pretty much any camera that's teeny, not a teeny 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 tiny they really are um there are some cameras that have really small sensors but by and large they're super cheap and that's not what we're comparing smartphone uh, cameras to no so smartphone image sensors um generally speaking they're at they're underneath 20% the size of a full frame sensor. They're really small. Uh -huh. um, and when you have a sensor that small, there's really no amount of optical trickery that you can do that's going to make up for the lack of uh, light collection and the lack of dynamic range you're gonna get from just from having a small sensor size. I mean, the thing is they've come far from like the beginning. Oh, absolutely. And it is useful to definitely have, you know, if you don't have a camera on you and you need to capture something really quick, um, it's great. But as far as, like, if you're going to kind of dive into, like, professional, like, photography or, like, professional printing or anything like that, you, you're not going to really get too much out of it. I mean, let's be fair. This, will, this entire portion here of the podcast is going to sound very self-serving because yeah. we don't sell iPhones. We sell cameras. Exactly. And we're also passionate about photography and just from the perspective of myself and Nikolai over here, smartphone cameras, even the even cheap ones are good to have on you in Absolutely. case you need to capture a moment. And, um, you know, we would never begrudge anybody for having that capability. However, to say that the camera on your iPhone is as good as, you know, a DSLR is it's ludicrous, quite yeah. honestly. I mean, let's just say that you're like you see something cool happening and you have your camera and then you have your phone on you. You're probably always going to go for your camera. <laughs> right. And there's a reason why photojournalists don't go around with their phones. Exactly. They go around with their camera. It's a great backup in case your camera breaks, but it's not your main... Yeah. And, and a butter. lot of people will look at a phone and they'll go, well, my phone has whatever megapixels of resolution. And as we've described before, like megapixels I, is not that important. It's like I took this picture with my smartphone. Like, it came out really good. Look. <clears throat> like okay but imagine if you took that with a digital slr yeah and sometimes pictures with your smartphone do come out really good absolutely but it also you have to figure out what your expectations are mm -hmm. if you take a picture with your smartphone number one you're not going to have um too much editing play with it that's for sure because they don't capture in raw yeah there's no like bit there's not a lot of bit depth in them there's not not a lot of bit depth. There's the color is not going to be as um, you're not going to have that dynamic range, so you won't be able to get really good detail in mm -hmm. the dark areas 
or detail on the bright areas um, because of the size of the uh, image sensor you're not going to have much low light capability so i mean this all sounds like we're just dumping on smartphone cameras yeah. and to some degree we are but we're just explaining the difference in that when you have a really small image sensor you're going to have a lot less versatility and capability in low light situations which also means that you're going to have um issues with uh being able to focus mm -hmm. when you're working in low light situations so surprise surprise when you take pictures with your smartphone a lot of them turn out blurry because or super grainy or very grainy there's lots of noise and that has to do with the fact that you have to expose that image so much longer because you don't have the same amount of light collection capability on a mm -hmm. small image sensor so i mean that's something to consider uh yes the camera industry has sort of been uh you know affected in a very negative way by uh, smartphone photography but it's that certain portion of the of the business that has gone away. So yeah. like those cheap point and shoots that everyone used to have ten years ago. Oh, I used to love those things. Yeah, but nobody has them now because you don't need them. Yeah, I mean, they I had small image sensors. They weren't really, you know, the image quality of those was basic. They were mm -hmm. for snapshots. You know, they were we call them point and shoots, and that's what they were. They're for casual shooting. Well, now your smartphone is for casual shooting, and for anyone who wants to get into something more in depth than that. The smartphone is not the way to go. Yeah. <clears throat> and neither would any sort of camera with a small, super small image sensor. Yeah. So um, are there any other pros and cons that you need to uh, address about uh, different sensor sizes? Or is there any sort of things that you prefer? Um, I think we pretty much covered everything I thought of. The only other thing I could say is that, um, just like kind of, again, an honorable mention, a lot of 4K professional cameras like camcorders... And even some of the point and shoots um, use micro four third sensors. That's like the main sensor for shooting 4K right now, video at least. Well, I think that's primarily because uh, Olympus and Panasonic, especially Panasonic, uh, made their name in video, and mm -hmm. they're able to provide systems that uh, work well with that with that mount. But there are other uh, Black Rapid, not Black Rapid, um, Black Magic. Mm -hmm. You know, so those cameras work on a micro four thirds format. Um, so yes, Micro Four Thirds is is widely renowned for video capability, but it's not really because of the sensor size. I think it's more that there's just more uh, stuff available as far as video lenses and things go. Hmm. Okay. I mean, for example. I mean, I'm not really a video shooter, but I just I, that's like an observation. I've noticed that a lot of 4K is professionally shot on Micro Four Thirds systems. Yeah, I suppose that's true. But there's also, I think the, the issues have to do more with the uh, systems and the software from the camera body, not necessarily because of the image sensor. Like, for example, Sony has uh, 4K capability in most of their camera bodies at this point. Yeah. Um, but people don't typically shoot on Sony systems for 4K video because of overheating issues. True. That may have something to do with the image size of the image sensor. Probably not. It probably has more to do with the way the, the camera bodies are constructed. Mm. Um, Canon and Nikon have just sort of not really been on the forefront of 4K. No. Yeah, I know like the 5D Mark IV all. can shoot 4K, but the files are like a ridiculously huge size, and it actually... The 4K doesn't cover the entire image sensor. It actually crops it a little bit. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah, so I think in the end that has more to do with um, just sort of the construction of the camera bodies themselves and maybe the, the, you know, the software, the actual capability of the um, image processing engine. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if it has something to do with the sensor size, but that being said, there's tons of video lenses available for micro four thirds systems yeah and if you're looking to shoot in 4k um going with a panasonic lumix g camera might be the way to go like their gh5 this that's being, like one of the most popular ones yeah exactly and uh, this is a 2017 we're recording this so right now the gh5 is sort of top of the line uh as far as 4k sort of consumer level uh cameras go so like a gh5 is like two thousand bucks or something like that yeah. that's that's you know a pretty good price for a 4k capable uh video camera i think that's more than fair yeah and it takes great stills too it does yay <laughs> you know because you've gone to panasonic <clears throat> i've been there and i've tested the the gh5 and it's a great camera 
So um, the other things to mention here as far as your sensor size goes is that what lenses you choose are also dependent on the sensor size that you choose. Yes. Um, basically, if you're using an APS-C size camera and you're using the lenses that are specific to that sensor size, they're not going to work properly or as well on a full frame camera. Right. So Canon and Nikon, just to use them as examples, uh, Canon has the EFS system, mm -hmm. which is their crop sensor system, and Nikon has their DX system. And each one of those companies makes lenses specifically designed for that smaller image sensor. Yes, so the lenses are smaller and they use less glass to produce them. Right, so it'll make it more compact and yeah. less expensive. Because and that's why they're designed for that yeah. specific system. And because you don't need the extra glass if the sensor's smaller. Right. Now, the mounts are interchangeable. Yes. So you can use a full frame lens on a crop sensor body but your focal length is going to change. Yeah, the crop factor is going to change on it. And uh, since it's a smaller sensor, the the full frame lens has more glass in it. So, but you're not going to be using all of that glass to get the proper image that right. you can have. You'd be of it. paying for uh, glass that you're not using, yeah, basically. Pretty much. Um, you can also use crop sensor format lenses on a full frame body, but. That's kind of... Uh, it depends. Most of the time you can, and your camera will detect it, and, and it will switch to a crop sensor. If memory serves me right, not, you can do that with Nikons. You can use DX on FX format, which is their full frame line. Mm -hmm. You can use that on the FX format cameras, but the camera will, like you said, detect it and change the, the camera over to DX format. Right. Canon, I don't believe you can mount an EFS lens on a EF camera body which is their full frame ah. I don't think it's possible because I think I remember I've tried that before and you, you can't do it the, the, the mounts are, the mounts is like the same size and everything but it, it won't click into it okay um, I'm aware that you can do it for Sony cameras as well yes you know you can do it for Sony so Sony has their full frame uh, they call it FE and then you have your regular E mount lenses which will fit on the crop sensor cameras and those are interchangeable as well Although, like we said before, um, using the wrong format lens on your camera is kind of, you're going to be it's taking... Like a step back. Yeah, you're, <laughs> you're stepping back in one way or the other. You're either going to be using a super expensive lens that's on a consumer level body, or you're going to be um, using a cheaper lens on a full frame body. In either way, it's like yeah. you're kind of shooting yourself in the so foot. So with that being said, if you are in the market for a camera and you wind up getting a crop sensor camera first but you know in the future like you're definitely going to invest in a full frame you know get the get the crop sensor camera with like one or two kit lenses and then if you want to get the new lenses first you can get the full frame lenses for it and then get the camera and then you'll have a, a lens for that camera yeah um lenses especially full frame lenses will always retain their value Yes. So why not? They don't really drop in price at all. Yeah. Unless they find some kind of defect in them in the future. Right. Yep. So uh, that's a good plan. It's always good if you're looking to upgrade in the future, go for the full frame lenses because they will work on a smaller uh, sensor camera mm -hmm. body. Just figure that for a while you're not going to be getting the full capability of that lens until you have an image sensor to match up yeah. with it. Um, so then basically you just have to figure out what works for you. And especially uh, budget was generally the, the biggest concern when it yes. comes to choosing between a crop sensor and a full frame camera. Because full frames, there are no full frames that aren't at least four digits. Generally, they'll start somewhere around 1500 mm -hmm. and work their way up until, uh, you know, you're spending four to $5,000 on something like a Sony A9 or a Canon. Um, 1D. Yeah. Or that, yeah. One DX. How much? At, we're, I, I think I, there's I, keep a I hate to keep dating this podcast, but what about? I think about, there's like six to eight thousand dollars there flagship right now. Yeah, but what if you went one level below that and you went with like a five D Mark IV? That is going for around three thousand, I think, right now, or right. a little under when it goes on sale. So, like your top level full frame camera that isn't the super professional choice, 
that's still going to run you three grand yeah. plus, and that's not including lenses or anything like that. So yeah, there's professional level and there's super professional level. There's super prof- ultra professional. I've only gotten to the professional level. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know what I'm talking about. It's yeah. just what people want to spend on their camera bodies, and most people don't want to spend that kind of money. It's so a ridiculous amount full of frame, money. Full frame image sensors, there is a um, you know an entry point, and it's going to be considerably uh it's, it's going to be over a thousand bucks at the very least yeah i mean the only reason you would really need to buy a like super professional camera is again if you know the ins and outs of photography you know how to shoot manual in and out right it, there's no other reason to get that kind of camera so then let's say let's say full frames for people who are really into photography mm-hmm. or know that they're going to be spending a lot of time um learning the ins and outs like you said and uh, using it for, I don't know, professional purposes. Most hobbyists, most you know, beginning photographers and novices are not really going to need that kind of no. resolving power. They're not going to need that kind of low light performance. If you can afford it, and you don't mind carrying around a little extra weight, then why the hell not? Yeah. But um, for most people, they're going to be starting off with uh, an APS-C format camera yeah. or a Micro Four Thirds format. Yeah, those are the enthusiast cameras to me. If you're go, if you know that you're like, if you're going to edit your your photos and you're going to shoot and raw and you have the space and you or you're going to invest in the storage space on your computer, you have a computer that can handle editing full frame raw pictures. And you don't mind spending the money on the lenses. And you don't mind spending <laughs> the money on the equipment. That's yeah. the way to go. But mm-hmm. if you're just an enthusiast, you're going to be shooting in JPEGs. You're not going to really do too much editing aside from like, you know, if you have the Wi-Fi option, you can do a little editing on your phone or you're using like Photoshop Elements or some kind of smaller program. Um, the APS-C size cameras are the way to go. Like their JPEGs come out completely fine. And that being said, almost any camera that has, and I would dare say that any camera that uses an image sensor uh, an APS-C image sensor is going to be shooting in RAW as well if you decide to yeah, set, I do set it to RAW. Yeah, most of them have RAWs now. And um, you will be able to, like you said before, there's plenty of professionals that shoot with a crop sensor camera. Mm-hmm. Um, you can get great pictures out of any size image sensor. It just really depends what optics you put on it and what kind of... Uh, what skill you have behind the camera and lighting let's not forget lighting that makes a huge difference so there's no shame in buying a camera that's under a thousand bucks or under 500 bucks or whatever it is you can afford you just have to learn more to get the most out of it yeah i mean my fujifilm cameras which are crop sensor cameras i almost exclusively shoot them in jpeg Mm -hmm. i don't really pull it on raw if i know i need to shoot raw and i know i'm gonna do a lot of heavy editing and i need a lot of dynamic range that's when i'll bring my my canon or my nikon with me but i would say that in most situations you don't feel hindered by having a smaller image sensor on the fujifilms format no i honestly in some aspects i love the way my jpegs come out better than if i would bring my big camera with me Mm -hmm. so again it's it's really what um what your budget is and what sort of expectations you have so if you don't know which sensor size to choose and you don't have a lot of money to throw around an APS-C a Micro Four Thirds totally fine um, and you will be able to if as long as you you know really try and educate yourself on the on the subject and you practice a lot and you really learn about lighting you'll be able to get pro professional level imagery out of any size image sensor so we generally say bigger is better, but not always. There's, there's there's trade-offs. Yes. You know, I have I shoot with an A6000 primarily because it's a very small camera body and it's really fast and I still get great pictures out of it. And you'll be more likely to carry that around with you uh, than yes. I just that's a point you have to always go back to with the mirrorless systems or like the the compact advanced point and shoots. They're smaller you're more likely to carry them, which means you're going to shoot with them more. Yep, and I think that's probably overall, aside from the cost, the biggest advantage of having a camera with a a crop sensor Mm -hmm. is that you're going to have smaller equipment overall, and you're just going to be able to carry that that system with you much more often. The telephoto lenses are going to be smaller. The prime lenses are going to be smaller. You'll be able to walk around with little pancake lenses, depending Mm -hmm. on what system you have. like for example the sony aps-c cameras they come with a little 16 to 50 and that thing's an inch long it's a great little lens um olympus 
Panasonic, they have nice little compact lenses as well that fit right in your pocket. Yep. And um, if you're shooting with a DSLR instead of a mirrorless, you're definitely getting a smaller camera body and a smaller lens on uh, camera and Nikon DSLRs as well when you're going with a crop sensor. Yep. So again, many trade-offs in photography, but um, you really just have to figure out what it is that fits your lifestyle and your uh, aesthetic, you know, that's it. Yeah, that's that's image sensors. <laughs> I don't know if there's anything else. I mean, we don't want to get too much into the technical stuff. You know, we could talk about color filters and anti-aliasing filters and how to clean your image sensor, but maybe we could uh, save all that stuff for another day. Yeah, or if you want us to talk about that, let us know. Yeah, but in the meantime, just uh, take some of the knowledge that we've imparted onto you today, and uh, hopefully you can make your, a good decision on your next camera or your first camera if you don't have one yet. But uh, there's plenty, plenty of information to... Um, mix around and stew on inside your brain when it comes to uh, image sensors. Just know that it's just one part of the potpourri that is your camera system. <laughs> <laughs> what an analogy. I don't know. But, you know, it's, there's, there's so much to think about when there it is. comes to there's, photography. There's so and much... there's, never, there's never a point in photography where you're, like, satisfied with everything no. that you have. I want more cameras. <laughs> I always want more cameras. I always want more lenses. I always want more lights. It's never ending. Yep. It's like a painter with paintbrushes. It's like you have like kind of your couple favorites, but you're always kind of looking for a new one. And the best thing you can do is to just keep learning. Mm -hmm. And uh, hopefully that's, uh, you know, one reason to tune into Camera Academy. Listen to podcasts, re <laughs> do your research on Cometa.com. And, and once you've saved up the money, then go uh, purchase camera or lenses on Cometa.com. Yay. Or rent one. Well, not from us, but... Oh, you had to bring that up. I know, but <laughs> it's it's good for the listeners. If you, if you really don't know what to get, rent a system. See how you like it, and then rent another system that's completely different, and see if you like it. Or uh, become better friends with your photography buddies, and, yes, uh, and just kind of needle them until they let you borrow their yeah, stuff. That that's a pet peeve. Not a pet peeve, <laughs> but, like, if anyone wants to touch my camera, like, it doesn't really happen often. And if they do, I have to put, like, every security strap on them. Put on your latex gloves. Don't get any smudges on it. <laughs> put it over... Put the, uh, put the strap over your neck. <laughs> well... Put this rubber suit on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go into the clean room and get decontaminated. Uh-huh. You're not allowed to touch my well, L-series you know lenses. It's like... It's like it's like handing your baby over to someone. <laughs> yes. You know? That's exactly what it's like. <laughs> it's like just like a baby. You spend a lot of money on it. You you pamper it. You take care of it, hopefully. You clean it all the time. You make <laughs> sure it's pristine. You make sure it's happy. Yeah. And then you hand that over to somebody, and that can go all, go out the window. It can. And sometimes... Yeah, but the difference is sometimes you're more than happy to hand yeah. over that baby. Yeah. It depends on what kind of day you're having, what I do kind of remember, day that baby's having. <laughs> I do remember one day, I my, my friend was in a desperate need to borrow a camera, and I let them borrow it, and I got it back, and it was, like, dusty. <gasps> and I, I, like, I silently, like, freaked out in my head, and I cleaned it for, like, an hour. Yeah. Someone soiled my baby. <laughs> <laughs> God. Well, anyway, on that note, um, thanks for listening to Camera Academy, and uh, we'll be back with another thrilling topic as far as, it, uh, as far as photography goes. We will be glad to have you back. Hopefully you made it through this entire podcast of us rambling about um, you know, little bits of uh, nonsense. Yeah, we had a lot of, little bit of various subjects today. We, we went a little off the rails today, but uh, hopefully you guys stuck with us, and uh, we'll be back next time. I don't know what our topic will be, but hopefully it'll be just as... Um, exciting and you know you know what i don't know my vocabulary but until is, next is, time <laughs> as i get older my vocabulary is starting to die down say the catchphrase oh yeah until next time we'll fix it in post control z take care everybody control bye control z